Good morning and welcome to the Power of 10. I'm Scott Black, board chair for Cumberland Region tomorrow. For over a decade, the Power of 10 has served the region as our premier forum to discuss issues related to growth and development. Cumberland Region Tomorrow is proud to serve as the host for our conversations. It is the keystone of our efforts to ensure that the region's communities are vibrant, prosperous places that provide the highest quality of life possible for all residents. We are very excited about our discussion today. We have two great panels that will address how our region can work to get the most from our riverfronts. This is a vital issue in our region as many of our cities have great riverfront opportunities for design. We'll be joined by Senator Bob Corker, Carol Coletta, and Andrew Trueblood. Each of them have experienced different perspectives towards similar goals of creating great places around the waterfront. Following their discussion, Lucy Kemp from Metro Nashville Planning, Mayor Joe Pitts from Clarksville, and Council Member Sean Parker, also from Metro Nashville, will share their insights on what we can do to ensure great placemaking at our riverfronts. We are also very excited to have David Plazas of the Tennessean facilitating today's discussion. I encourage you to be active members in today's discussion. Each panel will be taking questions from you. One of you will win the opportunity, will have the opportunity to win a gift certificate for $100 from Wilson Bank and Trust. A winner will be selected randomly. So be sure to get your questions in during these great discussions. This event cannot happen without the generous support of our many individuals and organizations that support us. We are thankful for the, supporting, the support of our presenting partner, Pinnacle Financial Partners, as well as the many other businesses and individuals that have joined us to bring this great event to you. We are also incredibly grateful to Stage Post Studios, whose expertise is making this production happen for you today. Now I'd like to introduce Reggie Smith, a member of our board at Cumberland Region Morrow and Senior Vice President of Pinnacle Financial Partners. Good morning and welcome to the Power of 10. Pinnacle Financial Partners is excited to once again be the presenting sponsor of this great forum. We choose to support Cumberland Region tomorrow and the Power of 10 because we live here, work here, and we love this region. The conversations that the Power of 10 brings to the region help us make our communities better places for all residents. So on behalf of Pinnacle, I welcome you to the Power of 10 and hope you take the ideas and inspiration shared today back to your communities. Now it is my pleasure to welcome David Plazas of the Tennessean. Welcome to Cumberland Region Tomorrow's Power of 10, Embracing the River. I'm David Plazas with the Tennessean and the USA Today Network to guide the discussion. The first panel of the morning features Carol Coletta, Senator Bob Corker, and Andrew Trueblood all remotely. I'll read all of their bios, then turn it over to them for brief presentations, followed by a Q&A. First, Carol Coletta. Carol Coletta is president and CEO of the Memphis River Parks Partnership. She is leading the relaunch of a nonprofit to develop, manage, and program six miles of riverfront and five park districts along the Mississippi River. Most recently, she was with the Kresge Foundation, where she was a senior fellow in the foundation's American Cities practice. She was formerly vice president of community and national initiatives for the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Carol led the two-year startup of Art Place, a unique public partner collaboration to accelerate creative placemaking communities across the U.S., and was president and CEO of CEOs for Cities for seven years. Previously, she served as executive director of the Mayor's Institute on City Design. Next, Senator Bob Corker. You likely know Bob Corker, our next guest, best from his two terms in the United States Senate, where he became chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and served as an active member of the Senate Banking Committee. Prior to his time in Washington, he was commissioner of finance for the state of Tennessee and mayor of Chattanooga, but he spent most of his life in business and he's used that results-driven businessman's perspective in each phase of his career, including as mayor. He led the scenic city from 2001 to 2005 during what became a highly transformative period for the city, including the development of the $120 million 21st century waterfront project, which we'll hear more about today. Last but not least, Andrew Trueblood has served as the director of the DC Office of Planning since November 2018. Prior to that time, he was the Chief of Staff at DC's Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, 
where he guided economic policy, development, including legislative and budget proposals, and oversaw the operations of the 80-person agency. He also oversaw policy coordination among 11 district agencies, including planning, housing, transportation, regulatory, and creative agencies. Before joining the district government, Andrew helped start up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Prior to his federal government service, Andrew worked on redevelopment, planning, and finance for the DC Housing Authority. Now let's go to the presentations, starting with Carol. Great, thanks so much. Um, Memphis has six miles of Mississippi Riverfront, adjacent to downtown and at the city's front door. And the, the Mississippi River at Memphis is at its widest and wildest. You stand in downtown, look across the river, and what you see is an Arkansas floodplain. And, and because the river rises and falls 55 feet a year, there are many times when you look across at Arkansas and you see nothing but water. It's, it's an, an amazing sight. In 2017, uh, the city of Memphis and the Me Memphis River Parks Partnership, the organization that I lead, uh, commissioned a, a riverfront concept to look at 100 years <laughs> of plans that had been done for the river and to say, what is relevant today? What can we use? And determine the priorities for what's next. After transforming two former Confederate parks, um, each the, very small parks, one square block each, um, into lovely, popular little parks that are now known as Fourth Bluff and River Garden, if you'll change the slide, yeah, the partnership now has two major projects underway. Uh, the first is the restoration of the historic cobblestone landing. It's the largest intact cobblestone landing in the country, 7.4 uh, acres of stones uh, right at the city's front door. And, um, and also we have under construction Tom Lee Park. It's a 31 acre um, park, uh, a piece of ground that was built on top of a Corps of Engineers uh, berm uh, that was uh, meant to stabilize the uh, the bank. And that uh, park, that piece of land is undergoing a, a $61 million uh, renovation, um, transformation really, under the direction of internationally renowned uh, design firms, Studio Gang and Scape. The park that we're building has a number of exciting features, including the Cutbank Bluff. Uh, Memphis sits on a very high bluff, the river's at the bottom, and there was no way for ADA access or even people who are a little bit physically challenged to get from the top of the bluff to the river. We're building the first ADA accessible ramp. It's well under construction. Um, and I mean, it looks just like the rendering. So we're really excited to, to get that piece of the park underway. That was uh, our sort of a, a first move that we made. Uh, and then once you arrive at the bottom of that uh, ADA ramp, uh, you'll come down to a, into the park at the Civic Entry, Civic Gateway in a beautiful mist fountain um, at the park's entry. Then we have food and beverage pavilions. We have a uh, Civic Canopy that has 20,000 uh, feet, if you'll change the slide a couple of times, uh, Civic Canopy, uh, one more slide, yeah, 20,000 square feet under roof. Uh, that will be, I think, a fabulous um, architectural structure and gathering place for Memphis and for the park. Uh, also, we have a playground that is designed by Monstrum. We're excited about that. I think this will be their sixth playground in the US. And it's very large, all ages, um, lots of fun, including adults, by the way. And then we have an exciting uh, new piece of uh, artwork um, in this section of the park that's called the Community Batcher. Um, we'll announce that next week. We're really excited about that. It really recognizes and honors the story of the, the man whose name is on the park, Tom Lee, who in 1925 saved 32 people from drowning in the Mississippi River when he could not swim himself. Uh, but that's going to be, that will memorialize his story. The Habitat Terrace, which is the southernmost part of the park today, not available uh, to anyone. Um, We'll have outdoor classrooms, a pollinator lab. It's very, it's a very in, in environmentally um, uh, unusual uh, 
park to exist right at a city's front door. Very excited about that. A log scramble, sound garden, lots of things going on there and really taking advantage of out, outdoor classrooms. And all of that is organized around three big festival lawns uh, that are there uh, to house festivals and uh, 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 ongoing. So let me say that Tomley Park and the Cobblestone Landing will both be completed in mid 2023. And uh, and they both anchor what is a fast growing uh, riverfront district in Memphis. Uh, as we've been building this park, we've also seen the rise of, and if you change the slide, uh, hotels and, uh, and residences uh, just at the top of the bluff. So right where we're building that beautiful new cut bank bluff, uh, this is now sitting right at the top and with two more hotels to come. So lots of activity in this riverfront district. Um, and by the time we're finished, Memphis will have remade 26 blocks of it, riverfront in, uh, in eight, um, eight years. So, so let me just say, just to wrap up real quickly, uh, I, I, just what have we learned? And we could talk about this more in the conversation, but, you know, if it were easy, like uh, uh, Pitt Hyde always says, if it were easy, someone else would have done it. And it's not easy to do this work. Uh, public space, uh, second public space deserves great design, great management, and great program uh, so that people with financial options about where they want to spend their time, will spend time there, and people who will never get that Disneyland vacation will also spend time there. Mixing people in space, same time, same place, is very hard and really important. Uh, third is connecting all the space you can along your riverfront so that people can walk and bike really easily. And uh, fourth, Public-private partnerships depend on the kind of trust that can't be codified in a management agreement, but you have to have a management agreement. And finally, leadership matters, and there's nobody better to talk about leadership than Senator Bob Corker, who led um, Chattanooga's Riverfront Transformation, so I can't wait to hear what he has to say. So thank you. Senator Bob Corker for his presentation. Well, thank you, David, and I'm so honored to be here with Carol, who's most impressive, as is Andrew, and I look forward to, to his presentation. Um, I, I'm glad to be with you. It was a great privilege, I think, all of you would know to be a United States Senator for 12 years, but as I've said many times, nothing more rewarding than being the mayor of a city and being able to work on issues like this. And, you know, we all learn from other people, and what Carol, the outstanding job she's done in Memphis, and Andrew in Washington, and our little efforts here in Chattanooga are what were unique to us. Each city and each area is different and they have to build on their strengths uh, in their own ways. And so we learn from other people just like uh, maybe some people are doing today. Our city went through a visioning process in 1986 and it was a great moment in our city's history. And out of that, we envisioned all kinds of things happening in our city. We laid out 16 goals. Uh, I was a young business person in my early 30s during that period of time, and, and uh, what a great process to be a part of. One of the things was connecting with the river, and out of that uh, came a, a freshwater aquarium in 1992. And so all across the country, people talked about Chattanooga uh, and how we had reconnected to the river. Uh, in 2001, I, I can't believe I even did it, but I'm so glad I did. I ran for mayor of Chattanooga and uh, was a civic leader in our community. Um, and I, I had a really tight agenda and it focused on uh, education, focused on crime, focused on recruitment, um, focused on building a mega site uh, to, to house something like Volkswagen, which ultimately happened. And I'm gonna digress for a moment and tell Carol I could not be happier for her, for her part of the state, for our whole st state in general with this new Ford announcement. I was just uh, so excited when the governor called to let me know what was happening. And it's gonna be transformative for that part of the area, but we wanted the same here and accomplished it. Uh, I had a digital vision which led to us becoming Gig City where all of our citizens are connected to a gigabyte of connectivity. But I did not focus on the downtown area. I mean, there'd been so much written about it. It just wasn't uh, part of our focus. 
about a month after I was elected, I was down near the freshwater aquarium and looked around and realized that we were anything but connected to the river. There was a high speed four lane divided highway that separated us like so many other cities in America uh, from our waterfront. And, um, and it was, it was concerning to me that there was this myth, if you will, all around the country that we had connected to the waterfront, but, but that wasn't really true. Fortunately, uh, I had worked with a commissioner of transportation when I was commissioner of finance for the state a few years before. Um, we were on very friendly terms. I, I funded his budget. Uh, I worked with him very closely uh, and knew the governor obviously very well. And I called him one day and asked if he'd be willing to trade roadways, give us the high speed roadway and we would create another state road for him. And he said he'd be open to it. Next thing you know, he agreed to it. Uh, the governor came down and announced it, and all of a sudden, our city's vision was able to be achieved. We had a charrette, 300 people showed up just to, to lay out on onion skin paper what they envisioned. Uh, it started creating energy. There were other nonprofits that became interested, the Hunter Museum. Uh, the aquarium wanted to build a saltwater aquarium beside the, the freshwater aquarium and our children's museum. And so a year later, um, I announced at our first annual State of the City that we were going to build the 21st century waterfront. We were going to have it done in 35 months. It was going to be 100% paid for. I'd come in from behind other people in the past and ended up paying for dreams that they'd envisioned and, and wanted to make sure that our city would not have any outgo after this was completed. And so um, we brought in Hargraves and Associates. Uh, they they designed and envisioned and created a model for us. Uh, we went out and did a hotel motel tax that we were able to bond. It was a tough sell, but, but finally the hotelers and motelers believed that this was gonna be a huge benefit to them. And by the way, it has. We had 81 one-on-one -on -one meetings to raise money to pay for this from the private sector and raised $42 million. And by the way, we had a two page document where we shared the resources that were created. 19 and a half million went to the Hunter Museum. Three million went to the Children's uh, Discovery Museum. Uh, a large part of it went to, the, went to the aquarium. 67 million of it went to public improvements. And so um, we were able to make sure that one had opened 35 months later, it was 100% paid for. Um, and we wanted to make sure that it created economic activity in our community. It wasn't just a park. And so if I could, I'm gonna now turn to the slides and just walk through the process that we went through very briefly to stay within my time. This was the way our connection to the river looked in 2002. And it really, it was just littered with on hot pavement blowing. It was just, you know, we just didn't have any real connectivity. Let's show the next slide. You can see the roadway that, that kept us like so many other cities in our state and all across the country, because where do you build roads? You build it on flat locations, uh, and usually that's near a river. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we wanted to, so we, when we had the ability, once the state gave us the road and we, had any, any, we could do anything we wished to do, we designed an esplanade, uh, a pedestrian friendly walkway. Let's go to the next slide. We wanted to make sure that we had connections into the city and it was gonna affect all parts of the, the, the areas near the riverfront. Next slide. This was what we envisioned. This is what we built. We built it in 35 months. You can see off to the left that we had all kinds of housing that was built. You can see off to the right, housing that was built, energy that was created near the waterfront. You can see areas out front where uh, spaces for people to gather. Next slide. Let's go to the next slide. This is the ultimate Hunter, Hunter Museum. Uh, interestingly, the Hunter Board wasn't sure they wanted to, to team up with us. There was some discussion about, well, do we really want to get involved with the city and the mayor and this astute lady who was chairman of the Hunter Museum said to their board, you know, the best time to get a slice of the pie is when the pie is being passed. And so they joined into our effort. 
with them uh, and all of their board members. Uh, each We'd have different types of people in each of these fundraising meetings of people to see, because we knew what appealed to the people we were approaching. And uh, this was the outcome, a spectacular Hunter Museum right on the bluff of our city. Let's go to the next slide. This is the Creative Discovery Museum and the improvements that came with that. Let's go to the next slide. We've got some animation here on the side. It's drawn all kinds of people. School kids come here on a, day, on a daily basis to, to learn about what they can do with their hands and to imagine. Next slide. Along the way, because we'd had 300 people at this charrette, and we ended up announcing and building a, a $120 million project, people became interested in other things. And so we had a public art meeting. We wanted to attract artists to our community. We wanted to express that. And so uh, we had 500 people show up for the public art meeting and we built it into the waterfront as we moved along. You can see these colorful stanchions. Let's go to the next slide. You can see how we connected the downtown area to the Hunter Museum. And again, in the, in the walkway going there, uh, turned it into public art. Next slide. And you can see the connections walking up from the downtown area up to the Hunter Museum. Next slide. The next meeting we had was about becoming an outdoor city. And we had 900 people show up for that meeting. And so we started making sure that the waterfront would accommodate uh, in the way that it should outdoor activity. We now have, we have the second largest regatta in the world now staged. It came from Atlanta on the waterfront as a result of the 21st century waterfront. In the next year or two, it'll be the first. It'll bypass Cambridge, just Cambridge, just based on the growth that's taking place. Next slide. Um, and this is, uh, we just had an Ironman last weekend. This was take, this took place uh, uh, several years ago, but it's created tremendous energy for our waterfront. Next slide. All right, that's it. Um, it's, uh, we'll turn to our, our next great leader, Andrew. I got to talk with him the other day and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from him. But let me just say this, mayors and people like Carol and people like Andrew, have the ability to affect their communities, not just for decades, not just for generations, but for centuries. And so the work that they do and people who help them really are shaping cities. Unlike legislation in Washington, these are things that actually affect communities for many, many, many generations and centuries. And my hat's off to both of them. Thank you very much, Senator Corker. And now let's turn to Andrew Trueblood for his presentation. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Senator, and thank you, Carol. Those are both uh, quite uh, interesting presentations. And I think you'll see some similarities uh, and some, uh, some new things, hopefully, from what I'm about to discuss as we move virtually from Tennessee uh, out to Washington, DC, uh, where we have had uh, some major waterfront redevelopments uh, over the last 10 to 20 years and have the opportunity to look back and see uh, what has happened. So maybe if we go to the first slide, I just will very briefly, um, uh, it's the next slide, I will say just for everyone, uh, the Washington DC uh, is, a, is a city uh, of 68 square miles and a much broader region that includes three, uh, three states or state-like uh, places, uh, Maryland, Virginia. Uh, we're about uh, 700,000 people in a metro area of about a little under 7 million. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here, I just want to, to our, our kind of hope, you know, us planners, we love maps. Uh, I know this may not mean a lot to you, but I'll just point out a few key things. Uh, you can, you can see uh, we're at the confluence of two rivers, hopefully. Many of you have been here and know it's the Potomac and the Anacostia River. And uh, there was an effort that began oh, uh, basically 20 years ago uh, to really look at especially uh, our, our waterfront development in the, in the city, especially along the Anacostia River, which I think like many of the cities that we've heard from and like cities uh, in your region, uh, I, I would say we had turned our back to. Uh, whether it's the infrastructure and transportation, whether it was land uses that were mostly industrial, uh, it wasn't a place we embraced. Uh, and so there was an effort uh, that, that started called the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative. It was, a, it, was a, it was a partnership between DC government, federal government, and a whole host of private partners 
uh, to, to re-envision the whole area along our waterfront. But it really culminated, I would say, in two major redevelopments. Uh, the one uh, that you can see uh, is, is the wharf uh, on the left, and then also uh, uh, a the, what we call what was Navy Yard, uh, but also we call Capitol Riverfront now, uh, which was a major GSA, federal government installation. It used to be the Navy Yard, uh, and it was sold to a developer. Uh, both of these involve deep work with the federal government uh, and as well as various levels of local government. And I'll just say one other thing you'll see here um, that's important uh, for those of you who are interested in land use is um, you'll see basically those darker, those bolder, darker colors are tend to be more higher intensity land uses. So in this map, you see there's lots of that yellowish and those lightish oranges. Those are single family housing and, and our less dense neighborhoods. But you see part of the planning around these areas was how do we build density around them so we could support the parks, so we could support the open spaces, so we could create tourism, uh, support tourism and support businesses. So I think that's an important element uh, that is really years in the making uh, in terms of transforming these two areas. Uh, next slide. Uh, there's a lot of before and afters here, and I, I worry, I, I don't know about you all, that they, they may be a little hard to see because there's so many. Um, I should have I should have followed uh, the lead of my of, of, of the senator, maybe done one at a time. Um, but you can uh, basically uh, you can see the transformation of infrastructure uh, from, uh, you know, kind of industrial, low density um, highway infrastructure to really active green parks, real engagement with the water, uh, really embracing this as a place of, um, of, of both uh, recreation and respite, but also uh, of housing and commerce. Uh, so the, both of these areas, I think, uh, are really uh, kind of sig signs of, of that. And, and both of them, it's worth mentioning, involve um, major redevelopment deals, uh, similar to, as, as the Senator said, a major public-private partnerships where our private partners brought in a great deal of money for uh, mostly, you know, for the construction. Uh, we would sometimes fund some of the infrastructure that was needed, um, but mo most of, both of these were very uh, heavily reliant on, on the private sector. Um, it's also worth mentioning, uh, both of these did have affordable housing requirements. Um, about 20% of the housing produced in both uh, Capitol Riverfront or in, in the Navy Yard, uh, the yards, uh, and at the wharf uh, had to be affordable at, at various uh, affordability levels. And I think that's something worth mentioning. Uh, it's important to recognize these deals were signed in the mid 2000s. Uh, so that was very progressive then. I think now we've learned even more and we, we found other mm -hmm. ways to find even more ways to support more affordable housing in our redevelopments moving forward. Next slide, please. So I just want to take a moment, uh, you know, we could talk about uh, how it worked and all the deals and all the q and in the q and I, I want to take a moment to think about equity. Uh, and I know equity is, is, is on many people's minds, uh, especially concerns about gentrification and displacement. And I think these tell really interesting stories, uh, both of these areas. So once again, I'm, I'm going to this map, which I know very well, and I recognize many of you may not, but you'll see uh, there's a dark blue area, which is the Navy Yard, the Yards, uh, which has seen a, 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 a huge increase in population over the last 10 years. This is some of the newest census data that we have. Um, and, and you see actually, you see the numbers here, uh, almost 300% increase uh, over the last 10 years of residents. Uh, the wharf, uh, not, uh, not as great, only 140%. Uh, but you can see uh, both of them have had have had have been major drivers of our growth in the city. And you hear um, many people are concerned uh, about what new development means for housing, affordable housing, and others. And I think these both show that they we we can develop in places where there's not housing now, uh, create housing opportunities, and release some of the pressure on housing uh, across our city. And these are two great examples of where we were able to to house thousands of new residents. Um, in, in um, these areas. When we look at it from a racial perspective, it's interesting too, if you go to the next slide, um, what, what, what you'll see is the black population as a percentage has gone down in each of these areas. But I think that the black population in each of these two census tracts has gone down. But it, what it does, it hides the fact that the population in absolute terms has actually gone up. It's just been dwarfed by the non-black population increase in these areas. So I think uh, as we think about racial equity uh, in these areas, it, it, there, there's uh, you know there's certainly lessons to be learned. I think we can continue, we are doing more and trying to make sure that we're even more thoughtful as we continue to redevelop. But I think sometimes you hear. 
uh, you see, I, I see pictures of these areas and, and as the poster child of, of gentrification or displacement. And when you look behind the numbers, I think you see that it actually is, a, is more nuanced. Uh, and in fact, I would say in, in a larger sense, these areas are critical uh, to uh, uh, the city being able to produce the housing we need to reduce displacement uh, and gentrification. So uh, I think with that, uh, I believe that's my last slide. Maybe there's one more. Oh, there's just contact information. Uh, I'm happy to chat with anybody who has questions. I know I, I had a chance to look a little bit uh, at some of Nashville's waterfront planning, and I was happy to see some of our uh, pictures uh, there. Uh, and I also that the firm Perkins Eastman uh, is a part of that uh, project. They they were on our wharf project as well, so very familiar with these. So uh, I think uh, overall, it's exciting to see the work you all are doing, and I'm excited to join uh, the Senator and Carol for a great discussion. Thank you, Carol Coletta, Senator Bob Corker, and Andrew Trueblood for these presentations full of insight and wise counsel. Now let's go to the Q&A. One of the things I'd like to uh, ask the panelists about has to do with why cities turned their back on rivers in the first place and what led to the reversal of this. Uh, perhaps if we could start with uh, Andrew and then uh, ask the other panelists. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, I would argue, you know, it's, at least in the Washington DC sense, we were founded in 1800. And I think always the, the waterfront was industrial, commercial, or militarized uh, in, in our case. Uh, we are the seat of federal government. But I think that many, I mean, uh, you look across the country uh, and the waterfronts uh, were used for really practical purposes, moving goods. Um, they, they were, as, as Senator Corker said, uh, they, they're, they're flat, uh, they're uninterrupted. So the great place to run highways in the, the middle of the, in the middle of the century when we were building that kind of infrastructure. Um, and so kind of for, they were very, just very practical. Uh, and I think as we, as you know, we get to the, the point we are now in the 21st century, uh, we see them as a real asset. They're not just a place to dump toxins or to move goods, although they can do that too, but they're, well, they can not dump toxins, they can move goods. Um, but uh, they can also be a place where we can, um, where, where families can go and where you can put institutions uh, like museums uh, and, and become an attraction. And I think that's as we move to places, cities that become uh, more about attraction and places you want to be, uh, that is that I think you see that movement across the country. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Andrew. And uh, to Senator Corker, I'd love to uh, return to you. You talked about all the charrettes and planning meetings and so forth. How did you turn that vision? How did you help people see what you saw uh, for the plan? You know, um, it was just so easy. Um, I remember, uh, you know, announcing at the first state of the state of the city, if you will, and, and people thought it was a throwaway line that surely we weren't going to do this. And 35 months with no drawings, no approval by tribal organizations, the TVA and all of those kind of things. But uh, David, here, here's what I, I learned this from a gentleman years ago. Um, he was actually a liberal Democrat who built Columbia, Maryland. And he taught me at a young age that Corker, whatever you do in life, do it with boldness, have a bold vision. Uh, and if you just get 80% of the way there, then you still accomplish so much more than if you have an incremental vision. And David, there was something about announcing that we were going to do it in 35 months and, and then people believing it. And what happens so much with uh, city plans is you create this plan and it sits on a shelf. And there's no energy behind it. And uh, it was just amazing. I mean, the, the resistance by the Hotel Motel Association just disappeared. Not at first, but disappeared once they believed that this was really going to happen. Uh, people that had never given money uh, to efforts like this uh, were writing, you know, were agreeing to give $250,000 towards this effort because they thought it was going to happen during their lifetime. It wasn't something that was going to be, you know, 25, 30 years from now, maybe never happen. So I would just say to folks, look, there, there's a lot to overcome in these things as, as these other far more professional people who know so much more about it than I do have, have know and have, have you know, experienced. But there's 
for, you know, being a mayor is to me a civic job. It's not a political job. And to have a bold vision just brings so much in the way of resources together. I mean, the agreement that we had on a $120 million project was two pages, two pages where we were going to share this, this resources. There was never a de debate, never a disagreement. Um, communities respond to to bold vision so uh, i don't know if i answered the question properly but 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 uh throw deep and uh you know the energy the energy that you create will be beyond belief if people believe you're actually going to execute and and tva sent 13 people to our first meeting unbelievable just because they really believed this was going to happen, and they wanted to be a part of it. The tribes worked together unbelievably uh, because we created a passage. Anyway, it's I'm, I'm stopping. It's uh, to me, it's all about visioning and leadership, and and every community has it. Um, I think just uh, yeah, again, be bold in what you do. Now, thank you very much, Senator. And to the audience, we encourage you to submit your questions. Uh, we definitely want to have a robust discussion. I do have a question for Carol. Uh, it, some of my research has shown that it was only in the uh, 1970s when Memphis really started to reactivate its downtown. Of course, we had the tragedy of Dr. King's assassination in the 60s. But since that time, there have been decades of, of development and ideas and plans. Could you talk about what worked and maybe what didn't work to help us get some of that context? Uh, on downtown, mm -hmm. more broadly. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I've been in involved in downtown redevelopment in Memphis for many, many years. Um, started in the mayor's office in the in the seventies, and so I, uh, I've, I've sort of seen the ups and downs and everything in between. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I think. What is relevant to this audience is honestly Senator Corker's uh, advice, you know, to, to really think boldly and um, and to get momentum and keep that momentum going. The um, and, and I think, you know, I love the story of Chattanooga because they did a number of big deals. Right. But they also concern themselves with the small wonders. So, you know, you had the Hunter Museum. Uh, that's a big deal. But you also had the connection to the Hunter Museum. Um, and that's a small wonder. And getting those those big deals and small wonders right um, and 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 together uh, is important. I think Memphis for a long time relied uh, a, a bit too much on um, big deals and silver bullets that um, were not as forward leaning as they should have been. Uh, but I love what's happening now. And I think there's going to be, um, I, there's a lot of momentum here, um, but it's been, it's been a, uh, a a bit of a start stop situation, and now it feels like we're investing in the right things to carry the momentum forward. Uh, you'd mentioned that uh, soon Chattanooga will be number one when it comes to regattas there on the riverfront. What lessons have you learned from bringing boaters to the riverfront? Um. Well, I, I mean, as Andrew was saying earlier, I mean, it's, uh, you know, look, the cities that are on the river are there, or the, the cities exist because of the river, right? And then over time, you know, the economy changed and you no longer had these, you know, smaller vessels coming into the city post. It was spread out. And by the way, as we know in Nashville and certainly uh, in many communities, you know, Industry ended up locating on the river. You know, there was ways for there to for them to deal with their effluent activities, I mean, and so all of a sudden, our, our they became clogged. But there's nothing like there's nothing like reconnecting to the river to to really reestablish a sense of place and and create a place that people just want to be. I mean, you you can go down to the waterfront and just see all types of activity. Now, these are are living mechanism living organisms okay and they've got to continue to be 
looked at and reinvested. Uh, we wanted to become the, the the number one city in America as an outdoor city. And I honestly, we kind of done it and in a way and i know other cities would debate that but but to be able to have these events uh down on the waterfront to have thousands of people from all over the, over the country show up it's just it just adds so much energy and enthusiasm and then and then by the way david i mean a big part of health isn't it is people doing things outdoor and kayaking and and rafting and you know so so anyway i'm i'm, I'm very enthusiastic very enthusiastic mm -hmm. about uh, all of us not just embracing the river but embracing the outdoors and um, it's just created a venue for us that uh it has been phenomenal again atlanta think about it the folks who had the atlanta uh, regatta in their own community moved it to chattanooga because of uh of us embrace embracing the the city and so many young people come here um let me just say one more thing there's something about that era of coming back to the waterfront our young people and the digital piece and some of the other things our young people were leaving the community uh, they would be educated and they would leave. Now they want to be here. And I think what Carol and Andrew, I know I've been to both places. It, it, it's an attraction for, for young people to be there. It's cool. And they, they want to be a part of a community that has that type of activity. And that's the best capital a city can have is their young people wanting to be there. Thank you very much, Senator. And Andrew, you had mentioned that in the early 2000s that DC leaders had made the visionary step to think about affordable housing. Uh, did uh, DC use or have you used community benefit agreements? Uh, so that's, uh, I, we, I would say that's a very specific term uh, that we do have uh, as some of, through our, some of our zoning work uh, where um, landowners, including uh, developers of redevelopments can work with communities to sign community benefit agreements. Uh, in our case, uh, much of these, the benefits uh, that the city is looking to accrue by, uh, joint, by jointly developing this, by, by, by using our land, uh, we're, we're in a development agreement uh, that was then approved by our, our, our district council. Uh, and that would include, I mentioned uh, affordable housing was a piece, but certainly other things like workforce training, um, you know, infrastructure investments, other type of investments as well were, were a part of that. So we see both of those um, because uh, these deals uh, uh, or these projects, uh, uh, as, as I think both my panelists uh, recognize, are complicated. Uh, so they, it, inquire, it requires the city on, on a part of it. Uh, it also requires zoning and land use changes, and in our case, what we call planned unit developments, uh, which, which, which include community engagement and outreach. And those community benefits are oftentimes pretty pretty local uh and and and, and, and focus really on the immediate community oftentimes supporting nonprofits or other uh interests that that community has so these projects involve all of that uh and i think uh to the senator's point uh you know it, it makes me think of you know obviously the classic planning quote of daniel burnham of make no small plans but i do think a vision that is exciting that can get people aligned uh, can really help cut through all, as you have to deal with all land acquisition and development rights and all of these other things, building parks, maintaining them, operating them, uh, that vision can really help you get there. Thank you very much. Uh, Metro Nashville is a consolidated city county government. And this question, next question is for Senator Corker. At times, most Tennessee counties are not. And so there's sometimes friction between the cities and the counties. What was the relationship between Chattanooga and Hamilton County? And was there coordination? Um, there was. I mean, Claude Ramsey was, was my partner. Um, and while the waterfront was something that the city more took the lead on, um, he took the lead more on the river walk, uh, to his credit. And honestly, of the things that we have here at Chattanooga, I probably like the river walk as much or more than, than uh, we have a, a long connection all along the Tennessee River that goes for miles and miles and miles that Claude Ramsey, our county mayor, took the lead on. Uh, so, so it was a it was really an interesting time where people, you know, there wasn't envy. 
uh, you know, people took the lead on different things. We cheered each other on. I will say, Dave, David, uh, you know, the type of government you have in, in Nashville, uh, you know, it's the best city in Tennessee probably to be mayor of because you don't have that conflict. You also have education uh, under the mayor and the, and the council of 40 people. But look, there's ways of working through it. I know Memphis is doing it. And, and let me just say one more thing. It's easy. It's easier for someone like me uh, who, who had an elected position uh, to make things happen along the waterfront. What Carol and Andrew, um, they, they, they have to work with others and, and they're, they're journeymen at this and, and their job is so much more difficult uh, and yet they've accomplished so much. So um, um, I, I'm glad that they're doing what they're doing in their cities. And I hope that this somehow or another helps. Um, but the professionals really matter. And we had, we had professionals here like them, by the way, to work with to help make it happen. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Carol, can you talk about the importance of programming the space in an effort to support the momentum for development and activity? Yeah, programming is, uh, you know, really important. And again, uh, Andrew mentioned, you know, talked about equity uh, explicitly. And um, it, it's interesting that uh, Cut Bank Bluff, I showed you uh, the ADA accessible ramp from the bluff to the river. That's actually six blocks from Tennessee's poorest zip code. Senator Corker, you know, you know that neighborhood well where South City has been built. But, but that's so, you know, so we try to program explicitly to get people of different incomes, different ages, different races in the same place at the same time. And it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, it doesn't happen much uh, in America because we live such income segregated lives. And that's the point I think, Andrew, you were making uh, when you uh, showed your maps and so I think getting, you know, getting the design right, I think is, is job one. Getting the management right, you know, is job two. You know, can you maintain a civil space? And then I think job three is getting the programming right. And for us, getting the programming right really means to not only to be welcoming to all, but actually to be engaging of all at the same time. And, um, and we learn more every day. We're really on a quest to learn how to do that, what works, what doesn't. And uh, for cities like Memphis, which is a majority black city and a majority black county in a metro area where the largest demographic is African-American, uh, it, it really, uh, and, and we sit, the riverfront sits on the western edge of the city and of the county, it's really important for us to, to get that mixing right. So, um, and as I say, we, it's tough, but we learn more about it, how to do it every day. Well, thank you very much. This next question I'd like to throw to all three panelists, starting with Andrew, then Senator Corker, then Carol. What one or two nuggets of advice do you have for Nashville on its riverfront development? It's uh, a, a great question. Um, I think uh, one, you know, we, we've, I think we've all talked a little bit about uh, vision and thinking through the programming and being thoughtful about uh, how you build a, a kind of a broad, inclusive place. Uh, one thing uh, I believe the senator mentioned, but I, I really think is critical for such a long term, uh, you know, for such a, a project like this, is to remember it's long term. Uh, it's not going to happen uh, in two or four or even eight years. Uh, the wharf, both the wharf and the yards, uh, happened over many mayoral terms and took a lot of commitment. And I think what that means is uh, you need vision up front, but then you need commitment throughout. Uh, one way is through political commitment, but the other one is through all of the important partnerships. Uh, and those can be obviously uh, the, the development partner, but also neighborhood partnerships, also industry partnerships, also, you know, all of those things uh, that, that can help keep the momentum going um, over various political cycles, over economic cycles. We've all, we, I, I, you know, I think all of us uh, have faced uh, various downturns uh, when you wonder what how, how are we going to keep going with this uh, and and in order to keep going through those 
uh, you need you need uh, that excitement and that energy to, to keep going. And so really thinking about those kind of multifaceted partnerships uh, and that long-term uh, commitment is, is how you see that transformational change uh, that can last more than a generation, multi-generations as the Senator said. Thank you, Senator Corker. What are your one or two nuggets for Nashville? Well, David, I, I am very reticent to, to give any advice to Nashville. I, 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 it's such a phenomenal city um, and the leadership there through the years, especially over the last 20 years, 25 years has, I mean, Nashville, what it's done through its leadership and community partnerships uh, to me is beyond belief. I was just over earlier this week um, I think that, uh, and, and each city's different, and and you know each city has different attributes. Um, I think what I would say is that look, they're gonna they're gonna figure out themselves what they wish to do, but there are people like Carol, like Andrew, uh, probably a few others that are scattered around the country, and I think um, getting advice from people like them as they move along. Um, to help overcome some of the things that uh, uh, can can be pivotal and as to whether it moves ahead. Um, so I, I just would leave it there. I, I'm I'm too impressed with what's happened there. Know there are too many differences in Washington, Memphis, and Chattanooga from Nashville. Um, but I will say, um, you know, really embracing the river uh, would be such an additional enhancement to an already outstanding city and I hope I wish them great success. Oh, th thank you very much, Senator. And I'll throw this question over to you, Carol. One of my colleagues, uh, Mark Russell from the Commercial Appeal is constantly in the barbecue wars with Memphis and uh, Nashville. So at least give us some advice. If we can't do, be as good as you in, uh, in barbecue, what can we do for about our riverfront? <laughs> well, uh, I, first of all, let me say I agree with Andrew and uh, Senator Corker, but uh, let me, I, I think if I had to add Two things I'd say, get the design right and get the connections right. And if you if you look at both of the examples that Andrew and the Senator gave, you know, connections were in the forefront of uh, connecting back to the to the water and not letting anything get in the way of those connections, both um, you know, both ways from the water back into the city and along the waterfront itself. Both both directions matter and uh, get that right. And a lot of other good things, I think uh, you, you you create the platform for a lot of other good things to happen. Thank you very much. Nantra, this next question is directed to you. What were the tools you have used successfully or unsuccessfully to address affordable housing? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to affordable housing, I feel like we've tried to use every tool uh, across uh, the spectrum. Uh, you know, as we look at riverfront developments like this, uh, I think the biggest tool that we had uh, was the land uh, that we had acquired or had been given uh, or that the federal government had. Uh, and that is the, really a great way to subsidize the housing because you can lower the land cost uh, and you don't have to put in money. Uh, you just maybe don't sell it for as much money. Uh, and that that is, you know, in these big redevelopments, I think quite helpful and, and a way to make sure that what's built uh, serves a range of, of residents uh, at various incomes. Uh, so that was an important one. We also use zoning. Uh, we have uh, an inclusionary zoning ordinance, uh, like many cities, that requires a certain percentage of new housing uh, to be affordable. Uh, and then uh, we did. We do have, although we didn't use it in these projects as much, um, we have uh, gap financing that we provide as a city. It's called the Housing Production Trust Fund. We actually just, the mayor just put $400 million into it this year. And that helps finance affordable housing across the city. Um, and can be used uh, where we want to get even more uh, affordability beyond what we could get just through the land sales, just through the zoning. Uh, so where we're looking to provide deeper affordability for our lowest income residents or a greater percentage beyond 20, up to 30 or even 80%, uh, the, the, that's where we use uh, that, that tool of funding. Thank you very much, Andrew. This next question is for both Carol and Senator Corker. Most of the cities in Tennessee are smaller than Memphis and Chattanooga. So how is land assembled in your cases? And do you have any advice for the smaller cities and towns? 
Carol? Um, not really, um, in that we have been fortunate in that we have not had to assemble land along our waterfront. I mean, that's the interesting thing. The city owned the land and it didn't have to be cleaned. And it gave us a great advantage. It's, it's, and, you know, when you think about that, it's amazing. It took us so long to, to get to it. Um, so, so for, for the waterfront, we've not had that challenge. And I'll, I'll save you time for another uh, question. Um, in that we, we were like Carol, we were very fortunate. The land mostly was in friendly hands. We, uh, uh, we did have one piece that was uh, somewhat difficult, but but I, I don't have any advice because we also were pretty fortunate in that regard. Oh, thank you very much. This next question is for Andrew and Carol. Uh, beyond construction money, where have operation funds come from? Andrew? Uh, that's a that's actually a great question. I, I think um, so often, it happens less now, but we would see great plans and it's always exciting to invest in all of the construction and, and all of that. It's easy to put in, it's easier to put in capital money. Uh, and then uh, who's operating and maintaining and making sure, you know, really tending to these places for the people. Uh, so moving beyond the sticks and the bricks of the people, I think that, that that's one of the things that you've heard from across the panel the panelists today. Um, and we have a couple of important models. So um, in the yards, we actually created a business uh, improvement district called Capital Riverfront. Uh, and so while the District of Columbia government paid for the parks, it's the bid uh, that is funded by businesses in the area uh, that actually um, kind of maintains and operates the parks. We put in a little bit of money as the District of Columbia government, but they do wonderful programming, seasonal programming for kids, for adults. Uh, they, they, they also can be a little bit more flexible in doing things with alcohol, for example, and a little bit more nimble uh, than sometimes we could be. Uh, so that is a great example. Now at the wharf, which is all owned and developed by a single developer, uh, that, that is all done by them. They program it themselves. There is actually a bid in that area, but the programming along that water front stretch is done by the developer who still owns all of these buildings. And they wanna make sure that the Intercontinental Hotel is full of, resi is full of, uh, of visitors and that the 930 Club, the Anthem, uh, the, the, the venue there is full of people going uh, and, and, and seeing shows and that the restaurants are full. So they have an incentive to really place make is the term that we use in planning uh, uh, and, 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 and invest in, in, those, uh, in those places. So, in, in, you know, from the practical sense, we sign cooperative agreements and management agreements, funding agreements and all of that, and we can talk about that. But I think from a higher level, really thinking about who, how you fund that operating and operations and maintenance and using really using the benefits of the new development, uh, using the extra tax revenue or additional fees that you might be able to charge to fund that is something that should be in the forefront of any planning and development. Yeah, I continue. wish we had that flexibility. Um, it, it, because you know we we start with bids um and uh you know hotel motel tax is probably off the table for us because they're already being maximized for other purposes because we manage what is you know what was public park property we've got a few other things but uh we the city actually when it created this organization or helped you know, agreed to the creation of this organization 20 years ago. It's a 501c3 that operates with a very dated management agreement with the city of Memphis, um, which uh, for years they they basically said, here's what we're funding, here's what we're spending to keep the riverfront up. We'll give that money to the to the partnership. Well, the problem is that money never increased over many, many years, right? Uh, it has increased a couple of times since then, and we appreciate it. But we that's one of the things we're going to work on over the next couple of years now is um, we had to do some things to give the organization new credibility, and then that gives us a chance to renegotiate the management agreement. Um, I will say that you know we have a number of, of earned revenue uh, sources, including parking of all things. Uh, and also, uh, you know, event rentals, park rentals, but also uh, a dock that uh, houses um, both excursion boats as well as overnight cruises coming up and down the Mississippi. And those are all sources of revenue for us. But uh, part of the problem is 
because we don't, there was not a city appetite, right, for a lot of commercial activity directly on the waterfront in these parks. Uh, we've had to, um, again, it's always a negotiation. Sometimes it feels like a daily negotiation with the city on what they will do um, and what we do and how we go forward together. It's, it's really just a constant negotiation. Um, but, uh, which means relationships really matter and having supportive mayor and, and city hall and city council matters. Um, but I, I wish we, we have the tools that Andrew mentioned, we just don't have access to them uh, to um, generate operating revenue for the waterfront. Thank you. This next question is for Senator Corker and Carol. How did you work with local private foundations and funders, Senator? Uh, well, they would definitely be, uh, you know, the major targets on the front end. And uh, we were fortunate to have um, uh, several of them to talk with. I know that uh, Carol has the same thing in Memphis. But but uh, um, anyway, it was uh, they were a key piece of it, no doubt. And look, if you go back to 1986, um, Lenders Foundation, uh, really, if you look at so many of the things that happened in our community, especially the Riverwalk and the first aquarium, and I mean, without, without our foundation community, they just would not have happened. Over time, uh, their relative contribution has diminished. You know, the, the younger people that were, you know, the heirs have moved to other places and all of that, but, uh, but they're still... Uh, Dave, there's especially in a place like Nashville. My gosh, um, I've, it is unbelievable the wealth that is there in the private sector. Uh, you know, raising money in Nashville, Tennessee, should be like the the, the last issue on the list to worry about because it's there. Uh, for cities like Memphis and Chattanooga, especially 20 years ago, anyway, um, a much bigger bigger factor. But uh, obviously, number one target. Uh, first meeting I had was with the Lenders Foundation, uh, and they committed uh, $10 million to the project, and, and that was uh, a massive the, – the, the director ran to our office. He had tennis shoes on, and he ran to our office where we had been making the presentations. Jack Murrah uh, previously was led by a gentleman named Rick, Rick Montague. They both had huge impact on our community. But Jack Murrah was so excited. They just had their board meeting. He literally ran to tell us. And without that, David, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Nashville got so much money sloshing around. Uh, it, it can do anything it wants. Thank you. Uh, Carol, uh, working with funders and foundations? Yeah, not much to add there. We, we have a wonderful partnership with foundations, with corporations, with individual donors, with city, uh, county, and state, uh, we got the county put first money into um, the riverfront ever. Uh, they don't own those parks, don't control those parks. It's great to have uh, the county as a as an equal partner uh, with the city. And they, you know, so again, it's just a um, everybody seeing this as good for the community and wanting to be a part of it, not seeing it. At, and we have actually a pretty even uh, equal partnership uh, on the latest project we're doing. That hasn't been the case on all of them, but this one, I think, uh, you know, lent itself to that kind of public private partnership that was quite equal. We have a question from an undergraduate student interested in knowing what they and other students or young people can do to have an impact. So I'll throw this out to the panel as a whole. If anyone would like to pick that up, what can young people do to have an impact on riverfront development? You know, I, I'd like to start because we've done a lot of polling around, uh, again, the latest project we're doing. And it's interesting to me, the, the most enthusiastic people in the, in the city uh, about this project about the riverfront is uh, our young people, uh, 25 to 34 year, years old, and uh, the people living in the crescent of um, disinvested neighborhoods just around downtown because they see the waterfront as an asset for them in their daily lives. And that to me is really exciting. It's like young people want to invest. I mean, they 
they want to invest in what's coming. And I think the more you make your voices heard, the more involved you get, give a little bit of money. If there's a, I mean, well, we have like visionary donors who are at a thousand dollars. They can pay that over three years. They can pay it monthly. The point is, I, I think to, to get involved, make your voices heard because you know, you are you are the people we should be building our communities for. And, uh, you know, Senator, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it was Andrew or Senator Corker, I think it's the senator who said, and I totally agree, you know, the, the biggest economic asset any city has is, is its young people. And uh, are they going to choose to stay or are they going to choose to go? So, uh, I, you know, speak up. And if you're not being invited to speak up, barge your way into the meeting. Yeah, that, that was Senator Corker who talked about young people in Chattanooga. Would you like to give any advice to this undergraduate student? No, I think uh, as usual, Carol um, said all that needed to be said, but, but uh, any, um, I, I'll just read the vitality of any community is ensuring that you create an environment where young people want to be there. And uh, look, let's face it, Nashville certainly has done that. And uh, uh, and yet, uh, I think the ways that Carol mentioned about getting involved uh, are very appropriate. There's, there's got to be an organization there uh, who's, who's leading the effort. And I apologize for not intimately knowing who that is or what that is, but uh, get involved. Uh, let me just say, I got involved at a young age, uh, and it, it, it changed my whole life. So I would say just period, whether it's waterfront, whether it's whatever it is, young people, get involved, broaden your horizons. It'll, it'll affect your community. It'll affect your neighbors, and that's what you're attempting to do, but it will affect you so much to be part of a giving uh, community that that where your efforts affect other people it, it will your life will be totally different well, thank you and Andrew would you like to weigh in on this there's so many universities there in the DC area a lot of young energy there uh, what advice would you give sure yeah I mean I agree uh, with everything that was said uh, I will say it's interesting you know when we do things like community engagement uh, some of the, the, the groups that don't show up are the young people, right? And the, even though what we're trying to plan for is for them and their children. Uh, and I think some of the headwinds we get are oftentimes from people who maybe uh, are, are less interested in that change in that future. Uh, and so I think showing up uh, and, and, and sharing your ideas and your voice is really critical. Uh, I, I think if you're interested in the field, I really encourage everyone to consider uh, getting involved that way. There are many ways. You can, I love public service. I love working for local government. I, I will share that with everyone. I think uh, the senator mentioned the, the, the enjoyment of, of working at the local level. Um, but you, you don't have to be government. You could be at the, in a nonprofit uh, you know, like, like Carol, or you can even work in the industry in real estate or um, at, a, at, at other places. So there's so many ways to make it a personal or a professional um, part of your life. The only other one I'll mention, uh, and, and it's interesting, I will, I will just uh, divulge that I live uh, in Navy Yard. Uh, so uh, I also uh, decided to partake in, in some of the neighborhood change, uh, you know, the growth that was a part of that. And I think uh, thinking about where you're living and the decisions you make, if, if you can, uh, can also be uh, a way to be involved in the long run. Thank you very much. You know, these next two questions are about development, and I'll start with the first one. This is addressed to any of the panelists. Is there a mix of development elements, housing, commercial, recreational, that is needed to have a successful riverfront? Maybe we'll start with Andrew, since you've talked about Navy Yard and, and the wharf. Sure. I, I mean, I think uh, I, I don't, I, I, uh, it's hard to say generically. Um, I think different river fronts have different needs and values. Some are much more focused on entertainment. Uh, some are um, more focused on other things. You know, I think I think there seems to be some level of entertainment and engagement and public space. Uh, but I, I, I think we've seen some. But the wharf is a great example where there is office, there is residential, there is hotel, um, there is all there's all non big national foundations are are, are there now, and so. 
Uh, I think that makes it vibrant. It gives it uh, liveliness uh, all the time. You know, I think one of the challenges you have about rivers that gets back to a comment the center made is they're a barrier. So you don't necessarily have access to it from all directions at all times. They're oftentimes at the end of a space. So people have to want to go there. They're not in the middle necessarily. Uh, and so um, thinking about how you make it uh, vibrant um, oftentimes does involve a mix of uses and you want people who live there you want people who work there um, but i don't think every place needs all of that um, some of them can be purely recreational um, and so it just depends i would say as yes, senator you mentioned in your presentation you uh, we saw uh, in the slides a mix of housing we saw the hunter museum we saw other things what was that that perfect mix for you yeah we look every every urban area that uh, seeks to thrive focuses on their their city uh, being a 24-hour live, work, and play environment. And so the waterfront is a part of making all of that happen. For us, the and by the way, uh, I didn't show it in the slide, but Blue Cross Blue Shield built their headquarters right next to the riverfront. And so what you want to do, I think, is while it may not be in the original, the, the first plan may focus on housing and it may focus on recreational and it may focus on arts. Everything you do as far as connections that both Andrew and Carol have talked about, you wanna make sure that it's gonna enhance all of your city. It's gonna help make sure that your city is a 24 hour live, work and play environment. And so whether it's a particular, a particular tract of land might not itself lend itself for that particular for a particular use you want to make sure that it enhances all of that in your city um and i, I know that nashville uh you know easily uh can make that happen with all the assets they have thank you and carol i'd like to throw the second part of the question which is what was the spark that drove the riverfront development efforts in your community well Keep in mind, we've been working on plans for the riverfront for a hundred years. I, I think the, I mean, in some ways, every city in the world, right, the way the waterfront has begun to take and capture that for pedestrian use, um, you know, as the old industrial uses went away. So that, you know, I mean, the, the time was right. Uh, again, I, I will as you know, just a note, again, we have a very different riverfront condition than uh, other cities with that river rising and falling 55 feet a year. So it is, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a bit of a different challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have the challenge that uh, Senator Corker was smart enough to solve, and that was uh, very cleverly, uh, is that, that road condition that separates the city from the riverfront, as well as a bluff condition. So there, there were a number of sort of things that kept uh, riverfront redevelopment from happening for many years. But... Um, you know, what What I think finally, it's in a weird way, you know, we had these two Confederate parks. We have Confederate Park and Jeff Davis Park, one with a, with a statue of Jeff Davis, not the Jeff Davis Park, by the way. Um, and when, when getting rid of that statue and those Confederate names, in some ways kind of freed up uh, the city from sort of being captured by that old paradigm that that defined those riverfront parks and allowed us to rethink them. And all credit to Jim Strickland, our mayor of, of the city, who uh, made that happen in a very clever way. So, so once that happened, we were able to take two relatively small pieces of property, rethink them, and reimagine them. And we could do it with a little bit of money that was... Um, uh, augmented by a national initiative that that actually I worked on when I was at the Knight Foundation called Reimagining the Civic Commons. And so that got things started. That then provoked the idea of, hey, wait, let's look bigger and look at all these assets along the six mile uh, riverfront. And where, you know, how might we, how might we uh, start th rethinking those assets and picking them off one by one as part of a, a, a larger vision. And so that really was it. I'll say one other thing that I think is always valuable, lots of cities do this, but we organized a trip. This is when I was at Kresge still, but I organized a trip for a number of Memphis leaders and took them to 
three cities, four waterfronts in four days. It was the quickest trip they'd ever been on. And look at getting your getting your leadership if to see good waterfronts and what's possible um, and do that together, I think is so utterly valuable for lots of reasons, not just waterfronts, but something I would strongly recommend for any city, just getting that leadership group, letting them travel together, letting them see what's possible, which helps them reimagine what's in their own front yard. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this next question is uh, very interesting, certainly in Nashville experienced the 2010 flood and uh, uh, what that did to the downtown and other areas of the neighborhood. Did any of you have to deal with floodplain issues? And perhaps so let's start with the senator and then uh, go to the other panelists. We, we did. We haven't had the tragedies uh, that, that uh, Nashville has had, uh, but, but certainly, you know, we had to be cognizant of where buildings were built and, and that type of thing, just like I know Andrew did. I, I do want to go back to what Carol said that's so important. Um, it was so impactful for me as a young man. I wasn't in the public arena. I was, you know, building shopping centers across the country in my business. And I went and visited Baltimore and Inner Harbor and saw what, uh, and I alluded to this gentleman before, but Jim Rouse, what Jim Rouse had done there. That is so impactful. And I, I think what, key, what Carol just said is one of the more key comments uh, that should be made because or, or retained is that it does affect you. At Greenville, South Carolina came to visit us uh, while I was mayor to see what we were doing. I was in Greenville uh, not long ago. It is unbelievable what they as a city did, but they did it by learning from others. And uh, there are people, there, I wish there were even more people like Andrew and Carol um, all around the country, but, but to visit and see what they've done, but also go to other cities that maybe are similar in size to what um, Nashville or whatever community may be em embarking on this, it, it matters. I mean, to see it, to see the, the, the life that it creates, to see the type of people that are there, by the way, from all walks of life. I mean, one thing about public areas uh, is it attracts people from all, it's the best of community. So uh, Carol, I, I think I'm so glad you shared that. Well, thank you. Andrew, uh, could you talk about the floodplain situation for DC? Sure, yeah, so we are uh, in a floodplain uh, and uh, you know, we, we are actually quite uh, prone to uh, sea level rise. Uh, actually, we are, we are actually slowly going into the water very, very slowly uh, as the water rises. Um, so that is a concern. I would say it's become even uh, greater concern uh, over the last few years. But the wharf, for example, developed, you know, developed to a floodplain. They, they actually developed uh, ways of, of water uh, storage and, and, and mitigation for, to ensure that um, that they're resilient. And I think that is something that we're very much thinking of in the future. Uh, we have a, a future waterfront development uh, project in partnership with the federal government and the National Park Service called Poplar Point on the other side of the river. And I think that that will highlight a, six, a 70 acre park and making sure that that park is resilient, that that park can handle flood water so that it doesn't go into development will certainly be a part of, of the planning from the day one, uh, rather than just kind of mitigating through engineering, which I think uh, is oftentimes kind of where we have been in the past. Thank you very much. And Memphis is right there on the Mississippi. Carol, could you talk about the floodplain conversations that you've had there? Yeah, of course, when we look at a floodplain in Arkansas and the, and the drama of it being covered by water and, you know, as far as the eye can see is, you know, brings that home. It's one of the reasons we hired uh, for the current work we're doing, um, Scape and Studio Gang, both of uh, both are led by um, uh, women who are outstanding in their field on the on in environment and and building in resilience. It's a wonderful article on Kate Orff, who runs Scape, the landscape firm, uh, in the New in the New Yorker about six eight weeks ago, um, and the. Um, the work she did in the wake of Hurricane Sandy um, and looking at how to rebuild resilience. I mean, really, really smart things. Um, Jeannie Gang, who runs Studio Gang, is on the cover of Fast Company this month, uh, also uh, renowned for her work in resilience. So 
what we wanted to do is make sure, and and by the way, again, this part, the, the current work we're doing is built on a Corps of Engineers berm. And obviously they had a lot to say about uh, how we handled um, the work there and you know what we could and could not do. So we, we have a lot of voices really mm, uh, who, who approach this through the lens of uh, environmental, um, uh, the environmental concerns and opportunities uh, with this work. And now we're, you know, we're, we're also thinking, I mean, about energy and everything else as it, as it relates to um, this riverfront. Senator, I want to turn to something you mentioned in your presentation. You were a commissioner for the state uh, for finance and administration, developed these relationships with the transportation commissioner. For mayors who have not developed those relationships, how do you do that? What is an effective way to get the ear of someone like the transportation commissioner? So look, I, I, we're fortunate to have a state where, you know, let's face it, um, we've had good leadership mostly for a long, long time. And our, and, you know, state government attracts people that want to make a difference. And, um, um, look, I, I, I think just talking to people in practical ways, I mean, people generally speaking, want to help others solve problems who are in public service. And I think that's true of the Department of Transportation today, the state of Tennessee. I think it was true 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And uh, it's just, Dave, David, it's just relationship one-on-one. You know, you go in, you're transparent, you, you, know, you know, share with them, you know, what the challenge, by the way, most people want to help you overcome challenges. I mean, approach the right way. That's typically what happens. Um, I would say, look, there, there's no mayor in, there's no mayor or county executive or county mayor in the state of Tennessee that the Department of Transportation head is not going to meet with. Okay, that's just what they do. And uh, I think going in armed with, you know, what it is you want to accomplish, asking for their help, um, I think they will will gladly give it. And I don't. What what was was unique? I mean, as Carol mentioned, was you know coming up with the idea of just trading and and being able to connect a state roadway uh you know it was really interesting the commissioner said well you know you're gonna have to maintain it if we do this and i said well that's great you're gonna have to maintain the road we're giving you too so so it was just a it was kind of a humorous kind of thing by the way the governor came down here and and at the time honestly wasn't particularly popular and uh you know he he uh, announced it and it was like it was like freedom for our city so um look it's uh uh i i think elected officials and public servants uh get a bad rap a lot of times most people uh, want to help communities overcome. And I know that's the atmosphere uh, in, in the state of Tennessee. Thank you very much, Senator. I want to thank all of our panelists, Carol Coletta, Senator Bob Corker, and Andrew Trueblood. We'll have a 15-minute break and be back with the second panel with Lucy Kempf, Mayor Joe Pitts of Clarksville, and Council Member Sean Parker. Thank you very much and have a great day to our first panelists. Welcome back to Cumberland Region tomorrow's Power of Ten, Embracing the River. I'm David Plazas of the Tennessean and the USA Today Network Tennessee. For this next panel, we welcome our guests in studio here in Metro Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Sean Parker, Metro Councilman for the 5th District, representing a part of East Nashville along the Cumberland River. He serves as a committee member on the Planning, Zoning and Historical Committee and the Affordable Housing Committee. Lucy Kempf, Metro Nashville Director of Planning. She assumed her job in 2018 and came to Nashville in 2016 after 10 years at the National Capital Planning Commission in Washington, D.C. Joe Pitts, Mayor of Clarksville. Joe previously served in the Tennessee House of Representatives for District 67. He was Vice President of Planters Bank in Clarksville for 10 years. Starting with Lucy, I invite each panelist to say a few introductory remarks and make their presentations. Lucy? Thank you, David, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today to speak about this extraordinary opportunity that we have in Nashville. I thought that the first panel really set the stage well about the possibilities and the future uh, for our waterfront, which is really exciting. And I actually brought some uh, drone footage of 
the riverfront in Nashville today, which we thought would help uh, connect some of the ideas that you heard in the first panel to the existing conditions that we have on the ground um, here in Nashville. Um, so um, if you can pull that up, I'll just get started and say that, um, you know, here you see downtown Nashville and in the forefront you see um, Second Avenue and First Avenue facing the west bank of the river. And Nashville's history, our modern history, if you will, of sort of modern uh, Nashville was born on the Cumberland River. And so um, this is zooming here into a view of the river itself. And then you're going to get a chance to see a shot of the western and the eastern uh, banks of the river. So as we started to talk about the east bank and the possibilities there last year, um, we were beginning the very initial planning steps and the city experienced the horrific explosion on Second Avenue on the west bank of the river and you can I just saw that in the um, west side on the left side of your screen. And so as awful as that was for our city to experience damage in the historic heart of our city, it caused us to really begin to talk not just about the east bank but also connections between the east bank and the west bank. And so here you see um, the east bank of the river. This is a study area that we are just really undertaking a visioning process and community engagement. And you heard Andrew and the panelists in the previous session talking about how important it is to create a vision. And so when you look at the East Bank today, what you see are a lot of surface parking lots, a lot of industrial land. We do, of course, have uh, the Titan Sports Stadium, uh, as well as Juvenile Justice. But uh, most Nashvilleans characterize this area to me during our public engagement se sessions as an area um, you know, that feels a bit like uh, an in-between, right? And so you can see here, um, you know, that the area has uh, bridges um, as well as an interstate on one side and then the river. And so the partnerships with the state um, and, uh, you know, the Corps of Engineers and many others are important as is direction from our community. Our goal is to vision uh, the East Bank is an area that has a cohesive and connected multimodal system of greenways that line the river, um, transportation options so that all Nashvilleans can have access to this area. Today, this is very much a car-oriented place. We think that it needs to be a place where bicyclists, pedestrians, people who want to move about by bus and the like can do so in addition to um, cars. And so we hope and aspire for a really exceptional waterfront area that can bring Nashvilleans to the river. I think you heard from the previous panel that there are cities like Washington and Memphis that had turned their backs on the river, and I think Nashville did that but as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we've made some great progress. Uh, Ascend Amphitheater on the West Bank is a great example of um, you know a gesture towards the river that was a step and we're building on that momentum so um, I think as you can see here there's a lot of work to be done to reclaim uh, this space for Nashvilleans in a different way turning uh, you know asphalt to green uh, but we believe it's possible we're really excited about the work that we're undertaking so I'll just say before closing we're in that critical visioning phase where we're getting a lot of feedback from the public about what they would like to see here. And the first step that we're taking is making sure that we have public infrastructure in place that can support new development. There's no housing here today, and so how would you build housing? What do you need to support housing? And so those are the questions that we're asking right now. And again, we're sort of in that first step, but we're really looking forward to um, to moving forward because we think there's just an exceptional opportunity here um, to do something great for our community. Thank you, Lucy. And that's phenomenal footage uh, from the drone. Mayor Pitts, uh, your turn for the presentation. Okay, thank you, David. And, and to uh, Cumberland Region tomorrow, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to be here and tell the story of Clarksville, Tennessee. It's good to be with Lucy and Sean. Uh, as well and talk about our beautiful city. You know, the history and the future of the city of Clarksville is inextricably linked 
to the river. Uh, we were founded at the confluence of the Cumberland and Red Rivers. Uh, of course, tobacco trade was all the rage back then, uh, less so now. Uh, but we also use it for commerce uh, as well. But uh, we, we are all about connectivity and trying to connect those uh, significant parts of our community via the river. Uh, back in 1987, former Mayor Don Trotter um, created a River District Commission, a group of citizens who were passionate about doing something with the river, that body of water that runs through our downtown uh, that really had been neglected uh, other than a boat ramp uh, and just a few spaces. Uh, but we all recognize the value of that. And then we also recognize the fact that Fort Campbell needs the river uh, when they deploy troops. They need the ability to load equipment and people onto uh, barges in order to transport equipment so it can be deployed to the far-flung areas of the world uh, in defense of our nation. Uh, and then we wanted to use it as recreation. Um, and former Mayor Piper uh, visioned and envisioned uh, Liberty Park uh, with a marina. Someone said, if you have a river without a marina, it's like having an interstate without an exit ramp. So we needed uh, the marina in order to uh, build on that momentum of having a river. But every mayor uh, from Mayor Trotter on has really invested themselves in having uh, having a, a piece or a vision for what the uh, river could do. Now, in about 2012, uh, we had a master plan for our greenway created, and I want to show a graphic here just to kind of give you a sense of how much we've invested, and we have many more parts uh, of this greenway to, um, to accomplish. And again, every mayor has tried to pick out a part that was important, and we've tried to assemble some pieces uh, in order to create some connectivity. We now have nine miles of greenway. Much of that is long, along a body of water, a creek, uh, a blue way, river, uh, especially the two significant rivers in our, in our community. Uh, but this master plan kind of gives us the sense uh, of what we want to do and make sure we maintain the history. You know, you could go back and play Senator Corker's um, uh, interview just a moment on the panel with Carol and Andrew, and you could, you could almost just replay it uh, and that tells the story of Clarksville. When the River District Commission was formed, we visited Chattanooga when Mayor Corker was mayor, or Senator Corker was mayor, uh, and we, we were inspired by what he was doing there. So we were excited about uh, the, knowing what was coming up there. But uh, we view the river as more than just a place to play. We view it as an important part of who we are, uh, and we want to take advantage of that. So we're excited about the future. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing more and more of that develop as we go along. So thank you again to Cumberland Region tomorrow uh, for an opportunity to tell the story of our beautiful city. Thank you very much, Mayor Pitts. And now let's turn to Councilman Parker. Uh, thank you, David. So um, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Cumberland Region tomorrow for putting this together. Um, this is a really phenomenal opportunity to, to talk a little bit about uh, the opportunities we have along uh, the Cumberland River here in Nashville. Um, you know, my family moved to Nashville in 1996, um, kind of when uh, I think the, the modern uh, uh, tone of downtown began to take shape with a lot of the uh, really intentional investments um, and improvements that were made to the area. You know, we would um, go downtown for river stages, for dancing in the district. Um, it just seemed like such a vibrant, um, amazing element of Nashville that, that just really uh, made it a special place to be and to spend time at. Um, and, 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 you know, now that I'm in the position I'm in uh, representing uh, the western side of East Nashville, which covers a large stretch of the, the Cumberland River, um, just having the opportunity to be a part of how that takes shape is, is just really incredible. You know, working with planning, um, thanks Lucy for your awesome summary of the, the work that you guys have been doing, um, working with planning, working with property owners working with my community to find out you know what are what are our priorities um, as this area grows and evolves um, it's just been been a real pleasure um, and you know that the area is so presents so much opportunity as, as Lucy said you know you have this adjacency to downtown you have these wonderful neighborhoods on the other side um, so it's it's about how are we going to develop that to sort of not only be a bridge to the, the density and the entertainment district of downtown, but to really serve those neighborhoods um, with employment, with entertainment, with dining, with um, 
housing. Hopefully we can build a lot of housing in this area because as we know, uh, Nashville's growing tremendously. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the existing housing stock and we have you know, corporate relocations bringing thousands and thousands of jobs and we're just gonna have to have a place for those folks to live. So I hope that that can be a major component of it. Um, and uh, as I said, I'll turn it back over to David and uh, look forward to getting into questions. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman. The first question is from Mayor Pitts. Senator Corker discussed how Chattanooga was able to solve the problem of their highway that ran along the riverfront. Clarksville has a similar road. Do you have similar plans or aspirations? Well, I guess you're talking about Riverside Drive, which runs through the heart of our downtown and right next to the river. There is no formal plan in place. There is mainly an idea or a vision in order to accomplish much of what Senator Corker talked about for Chattanooga. But ideally, we would do much the same as they did, um, make it a little more difficult because time and money uh, would, would be needed uh, to do that. But it, but it gives us an opportunity uh, to connect what we already have in the Riverwalk. Liberty Park is on the other end. There's not a really viable way for pedestrians to maneuver from one part of our a river to the Liberty Park Marina um, and public spaces with Wim Rudolph Event Center and Freedom Point being a, being major attractions in that park. So yeah, we, we have a vision and idea, but we don't ha yet have a written plan, but that's next. Thank you very much. Lucy, your office is doing a lot of outreach to the community around the East Bank. What are you hearing and what do people wanna see? Thank you so much for asking that question because we're getting really phenomenal feedback and investment from the community. We've had 15 meetings and counting and we're just getting started. Um, a lot of the feedback has been around, you know, a value of connecting to the river, creating public spaces on the river, wanting to make sure that the riverfront is an area for everyone. And I think that takes on a lot of different you know, kinds of dimensions from um, making sure that there's equitable transportation options, um, you know, equitable access to parks and open space and high quality access. Um, we're hearing from folks that housing is really important and housing uh, to the councilman's uh, comment is an, an important issue in all of Nashville. And so what role does the East Bank play um, in that discussion. We've had a really active and engaged boating uh, community in presence, um, urging us to consider uses of the waterfront at the waterfront. What does that maritime activity look like? And so that's gotten us into lots of conversations with the Corps of Engineers and others to talk about and understand the scope of that opportunity. Um, and so really it's been, uh, it's been an exceptional uh, engagement uh, activity so far. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Parker, what would you like to see done to ensure that the existing neighborhoods around the East Bank benefit from any new development? Yeah, um, that's, that's super important. One thing that I always emphasize with uh, developers, property owners, folks that are looking to do projects in the area is to take sort of a, a whole picture approach. So, you know, rather than just saying, here is my parcel that I own and I'm going to go maximize you know, whatever return I can get on that. Um, look at potential investments, you know, offsite improvements. Um, for There's one project um, in my district where there's a pedestrian bridge that crosses the freeway that, that divided the neighborhood decades ago. Um, that pedestrian bridge is severely outdated. It's not ADA compliant. Um, so one of the things that we asked that particular developer to do was to, to improve that bridge. Um, and it will be um, ADA compliant and it will be more accessible and improve for the neighborhood um, when that development is built. Um, we also, I mean, ask folks to look at housing. You know, again, part of that, that big picture thing, not only looking at affordable housing, so yes, it's wonderful to build a restaurant into your new development, but you know, who's gonna wait on the tables in that restaurant? You know, are they gonna have to drive in from two counties over? Who's gonna, who's gonna work in the kitchen at that restaurant? Who's gonna um, uh, be the sanitation workers? Um, for that building. So it's important that the people who serve this community are able to live in this community. And when we talk about housing, it's also important, the, the affordable piece is very important, but it's also the, the type of housing. So we need more, you know, a trend in, in, in development right now is to build these micro units, you know, the one bedroom, 700 square foot type thing. Um, and those are tremendous, those are needed for, for single people or couples, but um, we need more housing that will support families with children, families who are gonna send children to our schools. 
um, and that means three bedroom units, that means in some cases four bedroom units, but um, we, we have to think about the, the type of housing that we're building and if that's going to support sort of a whole community um, um, as we, as we uh, advance with these projects. Thank you very much. Uh, this next question is for all the panelists. Uh, were there any points made in the first panel that stuck out to you, things that you might want to emulate in your community? And let's start with Mayor Pitts, then Lucy, then the councilman. Mayor Pitts? Well, thank you, David. I keep going back to what Senator Corker said. Uh, he said two things that I thought stuck out to me. One was the relationship that he had with uh, County Executive County Mayor Claude Ramsey in Chattanooga, Hamilton County. Uh, I enjoy the same kind of relationship with County Mayor Durrett, Mon Montgomery County Mayor Durrett. He and I work. Uh, hand in glove on many of the projects that are going on in our community, economic development projects, community development, recreation. Uh, it's kind of a seamless uh, relationship there. The county is investing about $120 million in a multi-purpose event center uh, for our community. They, they're building it right downtown with a view of the river um, where Austin P will play its men's and women's basketball. The Predators will be managing that facility, so we'll have sheets of ice in it. So that's exciting. And then the second thing he mentioned was the relationships you build with the legislature, uh, your members of the General Assembly, as well as the commissioners, part of state government. Uh, we've got great relationships with our uh, state government officials and uh, especially TDOT. They've been an integral partner to what we're trying to do on the riverfront and we're just very grateful for them. We received about a $1.9 million grant from them two years ago for a pedestrian bridge. I talked about connectivity and, and linking the, the components of our river walk. Um, it's right there, uh, right off Riverside Drive and Craft Street, so we're excited about the ability to provide pedestrians another link to get across the river, enjoy the water, and be able to go explore all parts of our town on our nine-mile river walk or, or a greenway. So I think those were the two key points that I, I took away from that first panel. Thank you, Mary. Lucy, would you address that as well? Yes, I think one of the things that really stuck out to me was the notion that you must make big, bold plans and not be afraid of failure and not being afraid of putting big ideas out there. Um, so as the drone video showed, the East Bank has a lot of important opportunities, but also some, some constraints that we have to, to really figure out how to solve. Um, so how do we work with the rail lines? How do we ensure that we're hand in glove with TDOT to ensure that we're working together on mobility solutions? And so some of those may require really big ideas. And I, I liked hearing from the first panel that it's worth it to put those out there, even though, even if all of those, you know, can't necessarily be uh, accomplished. Um, and I think that um, the notion that we could build a green spine all along our river that goes to Shelby Bottoms or to the properties up north, such as where Oracle is going to be located, to connect to uh, neighborhoods that are, you know, north of north of the study area, to me shows that the lasting impact and positive investment that this that the East Bank work can do is going to is going to really uh, be important for the city as a legacy matter. And so I would just say to conclude that, you know, the partnerships piece and figuring out who to work with to accomplish that vision um, is important both on the community side but also um, on, you know, folks like TDOT and other organizations that may have common goals. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Parker. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I recall the, um, the, the planner from D.C. Uh, speaking about these major investments they made, um, you know, using inclusionary zoning, using some of these other tools that are available in other um, states and jurisdictions that, that we don't have access to. You know, it makes it very challenging um, in, in Nashville at times for us to engage the community and say, hey, we're making this massive investment in this area when we can't give any assurances that there will be affordable housing. We can't give any assurances that the jobs that it creates will be, you know, living wage jobs that will support a family and support people in a, a, a city with, you know, steadily rising costs of living. Um, so we, we see a lot of anxiety in the community because we're not able to really assure 
um, any of those kind of kind of basic community benefits or just community assurances that that hey I'm not going to get left behind when this deal goes through or that my kids aren't going to get left behind and it's it's really challenging and, and, and it, it, it definitely creates um, tension within the community when we, we can't sort of assure those kind of things so I do hope that uh, in the near future more of those kind of tools are, are available in our toolbox here in Nashville. Thank you Councilman. Uh we referenced uh, Andrew Trueblood from D.C., and this next question is for Lucy. One of the things that Andrew discussed was how D.C. was able to build affordable housing in the wharf, and how can Nashville ensure affordable housing is included in East Bank development? So there were three points that Andrew made that I thought were compelling. First was um, that we have to do housing, right, that you have to have a dense housing profile, and we're very committed to accomplishing that. And so today, the land is primarily occupied by asphalt and some industrial. Um, we want to transform that into a mixed-use environment that can support Nashvillians. It can support places to, for them to live, and I think that we'll make sure that the zoning and the design guidelines and those kinds of issues support housing. He did mention, of course, that uh, they use inclusionary housing. Um, we did have an inclusionary housing ordinance, which was um, preempted at the state level several years ago. And so that's not a tool we have available to us today. But I do think the other, the third thing that Andrew brought up was um, purchasing property, state property, federal property, and the like, and making sure that we can use that to our advantage. And so part of the assessment that we're doing today is a holistic view of all of the property on the East Bank. A lot of it is captured in this sort of no man's land around TDOT rights of way and things like that. And you'd actually be very surprised how much land value is encapsulated there. And so I'm not making any commitments. I'm just suggesting that we're going to look at every uh, every tool on the table to see if there is land uh, that uh, we can work with those owners to try to accomplish the community's vision there. And of course, uh, uh, I will and continue to advocate uh, at the state for uh, inclusionary housing again, uh, but I don't, you know, I, I think I think we have to continue to pursue the options that are available to us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Pitts, do you find that there's an appreciation of the river in Clarksville, and what are you doing to garner support from your residents for a more vibrant riverfront? Well, you don't have to do very much in Clarksville to garner support for the river because it's everywhere. Uh, we are excited about what's happened, but what's also getting ready to happen. Uh, as our community grows, it's important for us to take advantage of that, of those river uh, points. Um, and I don't have to garner support because the public comes to us, the city government, saying we need more access uh, points for the Blue Way. We want to do more kayak and, and canoeing with our family. We want to put our boat in. We want to do fishing. We need more uh, points where we can do family activities. So. Uh, there's not a whole lot I need to do uh, because the public is hungry for it. It's just now a matter of managing expectations uh, and prioritizing what, where those needs are. We've even got developers, landowners, that are coming to the city and saying, hey, we've got property in a development. We want to make sure that we provide adequate green space, access to the river, access to a creek, so that the residents, not just of the neighborhood, uh, but the surrounding residents can take advantage of that. So that's been a wonderful thing to see. And I also want to point out that we have legacy neighborhoods, what we call legacy neighborhoods in Clarksville. Those are the older neighborhoods that really started from the center and grew outward as our community grew, uh, that we want to be sensitive to their needs as well, that we don't get too far out front, that we bring them along so that they enjoy uh, the growth and the advantages of, of the waterfront just like the rest of us do. Uh, and we want to make sure they have connectivity to that. Um, Senator Corker used a word that I hadn't heard in a while, esplanade. We want to have a nice fancy sidewalk and a walkway where they can get access to that. Um, and those legacy neighborhoods are very important to us as well. Um, so yeah, that's what the public is looking for and we're excited to deliver it. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, Councilman, are there uh, specific things you're looking for in regards to infrastructure? How do we ensure the existing neighborhoods connect to the East Bank? Absolutely. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the East Bank and, and my district and, and most of East Nashville is, is really separated by interstates and freeways um, that, that really break up the neighborhoods. So 
sort of increasing connectivity through and across those um, for for um, multimodal, you know, cars, uh, pedestrians, cyclists, everything. So improving the existing connections, you know, the pedestrian bridge I mentioned earlier, uh, as a result of a specific private development, is going to be improved. Um, there's another connection um, at the south of of my district. Um, through the McFerrin Park neighborhood that I've been really pushing for um, at every conversation possible. And, and those are sort of near-term things that we want to see. Um, Long-term, ultimately, I'm hoping that the city can work with TDOT to kind of revisit and reconfigure what we call the uh, Spaghetti Juncture, which is a, a really massive um, uh, collection of uh, uh, interstate exit ramps and, and, and uh just, just twirling interstate uh, that takes up, as Lucy mentioned, a tremendous amount of extremely valuable land at this point, um, and you know produces lots of emissions, lots of car debris on the roads that wash into. So, I think that that's long term. We're really hoping that that TDOT will work with us on on reconfiguring that, maybe streamlining it a little bit to to kind of make more sense in the in the 21st century. So, that's what I'm hoping for. Thank you very much. And uh, Lucy, uh, Nashville's uh, riverfront property has everything from Nissan Stadium to PCS to Ascend Amphitheater. What are some of the environmental challenges facing the East Bank? Well, first and foremost, we want to ensure that our vision uh, accomplishes a great uh, sort of sustainability platform and ensuring that we're building in a way that addresses flood uh, constraints and concerns. Uh, this area does flood. Uh, I think the 2010 flood was mentioned in the previous panel and that's something to take very seriously. And so we're looking at areas that are most at risk and ensuring that they are open space, ensuring that our streets function again not just for cars but we're considering scenarios where they have uh, stormwater mitigation standards and the like that are incorporated into the design standards. And so that's actually a very different way of um, thinking about how public infrastructure can serve uh, the community in a really exciting way. Um, obviously, whenever you have industrial sites uh, that may evolve into something different, there are stringent uh, st uh, federal and state guidelines for how that can be accomplished. And so I'm, I'm confident in that, in that process. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if we can ensure that the platform that we establish for sustainability is set early in the vision, that's something that will guide the rest of the way. Thank you very much. In my experience, Councilman District 5 residents can be very vocal. Uh, wh what are you doing to engage residents of the district and also to ensure that they have good information? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are really blessed in District 5 to have uh, between five and seven active uh, neighborhood associations. And, and those groups meet monthly, quarterly, or as needed. Um, and they do a really good job of sort of providing an opportunity for me to engage with neighbors, hear concerns, um, sort of give updates about what's, what's coming, what changes are coming, you know, what, um, what we're working on at the, at the county-wide level. Um, and, and then with specific projects, I mean, I, I, the first or second conversation I have with a, with a developer if I feel like a project is going to move forward is, well, we need to do a meeting with the community. You either need to take it to the relevant neighborhood association or we need to do a specific meeting. And, and sort of the scale of the project will govern how much engagement is necessary. So, you know, a smaller, you know, single lot rezone to permit four units might be, you know, just come to the neighborhood association and talk. But um, some of these larger scale projects that, that folks are um, proposing uh, really do take a tremendous amount of engagement. Um, we try to take into consideration the offsite impacts. Um, you know, um, for a larger scale project, I think that really taking that into consideration, the impact on traffic uh, for the neighborhood, seeing if there's you know offsite improvements, providing traffic calming, providing improvements to things like the pedestrian bridge, um, we we come up with those ideas by engaging with the community. And that's why it's so important, I think, to get people in front of the community early on with these projects and, and hear from folks. Thank you. Lucy, Andrew talked about the importance of programming the space at the wharf and Navy Yard done by the BID and the developer. Is that something that's been considered for the East Bank? 
Yes, it's something I'll advocate for. And if you will forgive me, I wanted to just reiterate something that uh, the councilman just said, and which is that um, the planning department has assembled advisory groups, including neighborhood representatives, to advise us on um, on the project. And we ask those neighborhood advisors to go out and speak with their neighbors and, and help uncover issues and bring those back to the committee. The other thing I'll say is that a lot of the properties on the East Bank are actually fairly intensely zoned today. And so even though the East Bank looks low scale, the actual entitlements are pretty aggressive. And so one of the things we're hoping that the community and the neighborhoods um, are connected to is that the work that we're doing right now is a growth management strategy and to ensure that we are working and protecting those neighborhoods. Um, and so we're not looking necessarily at upzoning properties to accomplish this plan. We're actually managing growth that is likely to already occur on its own. I do think an important part of that is programming of open spaces to make sure that it's successful. I actually started my career at the downtown DC Business Improvement District. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of bids. I think they can work really well. I think they have on the ground sort of expertise that can help with the function of roads and parking, but also making sure that our open spaces are actively programmed with concerts or yoga or outdoor dining and the like. Um, so I think that's really key. And one of the things that many folks have said to me is, we really need to ask this question of whether or not the East Bank is part of the tourism platform that Nashville has across the river, or is it something that can be more balanced with a other neighborhood type uses? And so that's something we're really grappling with. I don't have an answer, but I think that a, that a bid or a function like that is able to manage issues like you know, tourism-oriented activities in a way that could be very helpful um, in this case. But we're just not quite there yet. Thank you very much. Um, and to uh, Councilman Parker, as we uh, plan revitalization and repurposing the East Bank, how can we be sure to plan for a more family-friendly and Nashville-centric environment to the point of Lucy related to tourism? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's no secret that Nashville's entertainment district um, you know, down on the other side of the river has been a tremendous success. Um, and the sense that I, overwhelming sense that I get from my community is that, you know, we, we're not looking to just expand the footprint of that. Um, so so I, I do think that something that's more um, business, family um, oriented would be great. I think amenities like Chattanooga, um, you know, family friendly, low cost or free amenities like children's museums and whatnot. We have the Adventure Science Center, but that's not in the area we're talking about. Um, I think those kind of investments are super appealing to, um, to families to come visit and spend time here. Uh, again, low cost or no cost, um, family friendly things. Um, I think the, the type of housing, as I said earlier, you know, if all we're building is one bedroom units, there, there just simply won't be families uh, living in this area. You know, I would personally love to see this neighborhood, the East Bank um, study area, develop in a way that, you know, eventually we, we say, oh, we need an elementary school over here. You know, that we have, that we have sort of the, again, that, that whole picture, you know, not just folks in their 20s and 30s living in one bedroom units, but we have people aging there, we have families growing up there. Um, I think that that just really contributes to a, to, a, um, to a healthy community and neighborhood. So hoping we can steer things in that direction. Thank you. Mayor Pitts, uh, what kind of engagement are you getting from local universities, nonprofits, and the business community with Visioning the River? You talked about the Predators and Austin P, but could you go into a little bit about the other relationships that you've been making? Well, uh, you know, you got, you got to continue to focus on Austin P because they're really among the largest, if not the largest source of supplier of um, white collar jobs in our community. Uh, and as they begin to train our workforce, we want to be able to meet the needs of those students who are graduating from Austin P. But we're engaged in a constant conversation with Austin P because they're in the heart of downtown. They're just a few blocks away from the river. We want to make sure that we connect them to the river, to the downtown. Uh, they bought property across College Street, which kind of served as the Great Wall of China for a while uh, because it was difficult to traverse across uh, College Street and, and connect them with downtown. But we, we, we're in a constant uh, series of engagement or meetings with them to determine what their needs are. 
uh, and we've been able to meet some of those needs and uh, vice versa, they're meeting some of our needs as well. Uh, nonprofits, were it not for the nonprofit community, I wanna put a plug in here for our United Way and for other uh, providers. Our community probably would not have survived as well during the pandemic because they provided vital life-saving services, food, shelter, medical services for folks who were, who were impacted by the pandemic. So thank you to them. Uh, but they've been just really important uh, partners with the city and the business community. We just finished a transportation 2020 plus uh, planning process uh, where we developed a transportation plan for our community, local roads, local transit uh, improvements, local sidewalks, local pathways, uh, not relying or touching really state uh, roads as much. And thanks to the city council, they approved the funding to implement that plan because without funding, a plan is just a book on a shelf. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we did that. The business community was key in getting that transportation plan both done and funded. So thank you to them and thanks also to the city council. So we've just had an ongoing dialogue. We have regular meetings. Uh, we have public meetings. We took the ideas to the public. They bring them to us. So it's not like, well, we picked a point in time uh, and we just decided to have a few meetings and then stop. It's just ongoing. And, and that's, that's proven to be very fruitful. Thank you very much. Uh, Lucy, is there an opportunity to build a neighborhood transit center on the East Bank that incorporates government-owned affordable housing? And just as a historical note, there was discussion before about connecting Montgomery County and Davidson County through some kind of transit line. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there is. Three of our biggest uh, partners on this project are NDOT, the new multimodal local transportation department. And I want to particularly acknowledge Faye DeMassimo, who's the interim director there, and has really you know, promoted with the mayor and the mayor's office the transportation plan for the city. We go, um, our local uh, and regional transit service, um, and MDHA. And I'm really glad you asked this question because Casey is a really important uh, affordable housing, mixed use housing project that is part of the East Bank study area. We're working very closely with them to ensure that the neighborhoods within and around uh, Casey, as well as adjacent neighborhoods, have all the access to the services that are possible on the East Bank. And so integrating that with a transportation platform is a very basic principle, and I think it's something that we would identify um, as a need in the area and look for opportunities for how to accomplish that. Thank you very much. And Councilman, how can we better talk about hot button issues like density? Because we know density is needed for vibrant urban neighborhoods. And again, as a point, you know, cities like Minneapolis have eliminated uh, uh, single family homes uh, as future zoning. But zoning is really strange here in Nashville. Could you uh, get a little bit into this, uh, this situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, zoning is very strange and complicated. I think it's I think it's probably complicated everywhere. Um, it's kind of everywhere that has a, a zoning code. It's sort of um, they roll their own. There is no standard. Is is from what I've look, seen when looking into other communities. So I mean, one one of the biggest issues just practically with with talking about density in Nashville. I mean, up until this term of council, any uh, you know multifamily, um, anything beyond a, a duplex zoning, so even like a quadplex, um, up through, you know, uh, denser mixed use developments, um, um, was, would allow the properties to become short-term rentals, so effective hotels. Um, and, and there was this just tremendous, um, for those of us in the urban core neighborhoods, there was this tremendous mistrust that developed around multifamily and mixed use housing because we we would be promised you know rooftops and and neighbors and and um, uh, density and then what we would get was this um, what can be a relatively disruptive um, um, activity in a neighborhood which is you know um, it's certainly not an issue with all short-term rentals but but it you're, you're a lot more likely to have the um, the party atmosphere and vibe sort of encroaching upon a neighborhood um, if those units are short-term rental rather than long-term or owner-occupied. Um, I myself lived, uh, used to live on a street that um, was, was, became probably half short-term rentals and it, it very much changed the, the atmosphere of the street, the neighborly, um, the neighborly feel. So you know, we now have some tools in our toolbox, and we've we've made some changes to the zoning code that have sort of steered us in a direction that I think 
it's easier to actually engage with neighbors and, 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 and build trust and say, hey, we're building housing that people are going to live in um, and, and have that sort of be assured rather than um, promised. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really critical step forward for us talking about density. I mean, there's sort of, there's sort of two angles that you can approach density at, and that is the, the low end. So with um, things like the softest reform to single family zoning, which is you know, adding like a detached accessory dwelling unit um, in the rear of properties, which I'm a huge fan of. I think there, we have a lot of them in my district and cause very, very little issues. Um, it's great opportunity for the homeowner, great opportunity for the renter of those units. Um, and then uh, the, the high end, which is, you know, sort of building these, these really large scale projects that, you know, um, are maybe appropriate in the East Bank and, and some other places. And uh, we've been working with planning to, to really look at where there's opportunities to, to you know, enact that kind of density um, within the community. And, and they've been very receptive, but, you know, it's, it's always tension. I mean, when, when people are seeing an eight-story building going up in an area, even if it's not residential, even if it's on the other side of a street from a residential neighborhood, you know, that's still, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big change. Um, it's a big change. So it, it's something that we just have to take on a project by project, neighborhood by neighborhood basis, and just have honest conversations with people about what the impacts will be. And, and that's my approach. Thank you, Councilman. Mayor Pitts, how are you coordinating with the Clarksville Metropolitan Planning Organization to plan the long-term vision of the riverfront? Well, thanks for mentioning the MPO. Um, and let me just put a plug in here for Jeff Tyndall and the staff at the Clarksville Montgomery County Regional Planning Commission. Uh, Stan Williams is attached to the Metropolitan Planning Organization, or the MPO, which is part of our Regional Planning Commission. They do a phenomenal job of helping us navigate the growth that we've had, the explosive growth that we've had and uh, the councilman mentioned zoning and uh, rezoning requests and you know that's that's becomes a hot button issue uh, when people want to uh, rezone their property but we work very closely with the MPO uh, and you'll forgive the pun but the road to improvement uh, for the river runs through the MPO uh, because not we're not just looking for funding but we want to make sure we we take care of the regulation part of uh, riverfront development. Uh, we've mentioned environmental uh, issues and concerns. We want to make sure that we mitigate or limit whatever negative environmental impacts will happen. And in, in fact, we hope we enhance the environment around the river. Um, Lucy mentioned stormwater uh, mitigation. That's that's a critical uh, part of uh, what we look at as well. But the MPO plays a very big part in what we do. And so thank you to, to that staff there that work very hard every day. There's not enough of them over there, um, and I'm not sure we could fund them uh, fully um, to take care of the growth that we're experiencing, but we're grateful for they're there. Great partners. Thank you very much. And Lucy, are there efforts to ensure that the Oracle campus develops in a way that connects with the surrounding neighborhoods and benefits all residents? So the short answer is yes. Um, and I would say as a starting point in three primary ways, although I'm sure that that will uh, evolve over time uh, as the project develops. But the first is in our mobility networks. We want to be sure that employees uh, of Oracle can uh, move about uh, the city and that residents can access the Oracle campus as well. And that can be accomplished through safe modes of travel and the like. Um, we're also ensuring that greenways, uh, that we have a vision for how to connect the greenway from Oracle to the south and to the north. Again, Cumberland River is a character defining feature of our, of our community. And the best way to enjoy that through public access is through greenways. And then the third is, uh, you know, pedestrian bridge that connects to the West Bank. And so it is our vision that you will be able to walk or bike from your home, uh, whether you're on the east or the west bank, and access the services um, on the other side of the river so that it will truly feel connected and cohesive. Um, so we have a neighborhood with a river running through it, uh, as our downtown uh, partnership uh, leader likes to say. Thank you. And before we get to the final thoughts, uh, Mayor Pitts, I'd like to send this uh, last question to you. What is the role of the river in your economic development efforts? Well, uh, clearly economic development is, cre uh, is critical to every community. Um, and so we look to it not only to 
uh, be able to ship in via barge, uh, via the river, uh, raw materials to produce products and services uh, for our community, but also to be able to ship out those finished goods. I mentioned Fort Campbell. The river plays a critical part in the deployment of Fort Campbell troops, the equipment and soldiers, uh, when they're called in a moment's notice to go and, and take care of a hot spot in the world. So economic development, it's, it's key. Uh, we need more access to the river for um, those raw materials to come in, get the trucks off the road, off the interstate, to alleviate some of that pressure, uh, but also to be able to ship products out uh, and again get the trucks off the road um, and move those products faster to market. Thank you very much, and thank you to our panelists today for this Cumberland Region Tomorrow discussion. Now we get to our final thoughts, starting with Councilman Parker, Mayor Pitts, and Lucy Kemp. Councilman. Yeah, thank you, um, and, and thanks again, um, Cumberland Region Tomorrow, and, and everyone who put this together. And, and um, you know, my, my thoughts are just with this process, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity uh, on the East Bank to, to grow major part of the urban core of Nashville in the way that, that we see fit. Um, and so I would just say, please get engaged. Um, the planning department uh, is, is in the midst of a study. Um, there's a lot of engagement opportunities there. Um, myself, again, I, I have regular meetings around development proposals and with my neighborhood groups. So please look out for those meetings, come to those meetings. Um, I know that my counterpart, uh, Brett Withers on the other side of the East Bank does the same and you know these meetings are not boxes to be checked these are meetings where we want to hear from our neighbors we want to hear from the community what they want to see what they need um, so uh, please get involved that's my that's my final thought thank you very much Mayor Pitts uh, thank you David and thank you to uh, the councilman for talking about getting involved uh, thank you to Cumberland Region tomorrow for giving us the opportunity to talk about our community, but also to learn from each other. I've learned a lot from the first panel, from Senator Corker, Carol, and Andrew, um, and then I've learned a lot about Metro. I've always had great admiration and respect for what you're doing in Nashville, uh, and so thank you for sharing your ideas with us. But um, Sean mentioned getting involved. That's critical uh, in our community. Get involved. Uh, know who your government leaders are, insist that we address the needs. But the river is important to us, and we want to make sure that we take care of it and are planning for the future. Uh, just know, just because you don't hear about it doesn't mean nothing's happening. It just may not uh, mean that we're ready to talk about the next thing that we're re getting ready to do in our places and spaces opportunity. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Metro Planning Director Lucy Kemp. Well, I want to thank uh, CRT and you, as well as the other panelists, for creating an opportunity, as the mayor said, to listen and to learn from, from one another. I think through that dialogue, we make each other better and hold, hold each other to account. Um, I think that you know Nashville is a city that's growing, it's changing, and one thing that I hear from so many residents is how important it is to connect to who we are and to our history. And I think the river encapsulates really all of those opportunities. And as we recover uh, from the explosion on the West Bank, and as we imagine all of the future possibilities for who and, and what we want to see and who we want to be uh, on the East Bank, um, I think there's a real opportunity for this to showcase um, a city of great grit um, you know, we've, we in Middle Tennessee have recovered from a lot of challenges over the last several years. And um, I really believe, again, that the river and the work that we want to accomplish on the river in coordination and with the guidance of our residents is an opportunity to showcase uh, what we want to be, you know, in the future. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you here today about that. Thank you so much to our panelists today, the sponsors and our audience. Now let's welcome back Cumberland Region Tomorrow Board Chair Scott Black to the stage. David, thank you so much for moderating today's discussion and thanks to all of our panelists. We so appreciate them giving their time and expertise for these important discussions. This was a great and important conversation and we hope to give <clears throat> it gives you some ideas on how you can help our region build stronger, more vibrant communities. This Power of Tim Forum will extend into our series discussions. We'll soon be hosting sessions on our region, um, how our region can better mitigate flooding, build communities, 
that support the needs of our older residents and many more important topics around the future growth of our region. Watch your email inbox and our website www.yourcrt.com for your information on these upcoming forums and much more. Again, on behalf of the entire Board of Cumberland Region Amara, thanks to uh, Pinnacle Financial Partners and all of our partners for supporting and making this event possible. And of course, thank you for your participation. Thank you for attending the Power of 10. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion. Have a great day.